Let's talk about something that can be a little bit taboo but really shouldn't, which is having excessive hair growth on the face and body. Now, I'm not talking about the peach fuzz that some people have. What I mean is having coarse dark hairs that normally wouldn't show up in women, like the upper lip, chin, chest and back. This is also known as hirsutism. Hirsutism essentially means that an individual, typically a woman, grows too much hair in a male pattern distribution. This is what gives rise to dark coarse hairs, also known as terminal hairs. And this is a result of overstimulation of male hormones, also known as androgens. In hirsutism, we typically see either an increased level of androgen circulating in the bloodstream, or if there is an increased sensitivity to the androgens themselves. Another term we typically use in dermatology for excessive hair growth is hypertrichosis. Hyper means increased and trichosis means hair. Hypertrichosis simply refers to a diffuse pattern of hair growth, which is not gender specific. The hair itself can be fine and lightly pigmented, or it can also be dark and coarse, like what we see in hirsutism. And unlike hirsutism, hypertrichosis isn't linked to underlying androgen activity. In this video, we'll primarily focus on hirsutism because it is much more common. In fact, some studies have shown that up to 10% of women in the West have hirsutism, and actually this is more common in those of Mediterranean or Middle Eastern descent. For many, hirsutism isn't just about hair growth, it's about how it makes them feel. And this kind of hair growth can bring on unnecessary stress and can have a huge psychological impact on the person's mental well-being. Now, here's the thing, hirsutism isn't just a cosmetic issue. Sometimes it can be a sign of something underlying with your hormones or general health, and which is why we're going to talk about in this video. Why does hirsutism happen? As we've previously mentioned, hirsutism happens when there is too much or high sensitivity to the androgens in the bloodstream. Men typically produce Produce more androgens than women, in most cases, hirsutism isn't associated with any underlying cause. Most women will develop facial or body hair gradually over years, typically after menopause. However, it is important for us to keep these causes in mind because they are things that we definitely don't want to miss. Now, the most common medical condition for hirsutism is actually polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is also called PCOS for short. This is a type of medical condition where women get multiple cysts in their ovaries and they also get symptoms like acne, weight gain, irregular menstrual periods alongside hirsutism. These women are also at an increased risk of developing other conditions like type 2 diabetes, fatty liver and high blood pressure. So this is a diagnosis that you really don't want to miss. Of course, there are less common causes that can cause hirsutism like medications, certain tumours and even this rare condition called Cushing disease. But before you panic, know that these causes are extremely rare. Most cases are either idiopathic or have no cause and are harmless or are linked to things like PCOS. So when should you start being concerned about hirsutism or start seeing your doctor about it? Now let me put it in simple terms. If the hair growth is gradual and you're otherwise healthy, you don't really need to worry too much about it. But there are certain red flags to look out for. For example, hair growth that starts suddenly or gets worse really quickly over one to two years. Hair growth that happens before puberty in young girls because in young girls you don't really have a lot of circulating androgens. You get other features suggesting an increased level of androgens such as deepening of voice, loss of this hair on the scalp or even irregular menstrual periods. And the last red flag symptom to think about is having uncontrolled weight gain or diabetes no matter what you've tried. These signs might mean that there is something else going on in your body causing hirsutism and so it's worth checking in with your own doctor. Your doctor will typically start by asking questions in the history such as your symptoms, your past medical history, they may do blood tests to check your hormonal levels, they may also organize imaging like the ultrasound scan of your pelvis to exclude polycystic ovaries. If you have regular periods and your hair growth is mild in nature, you actually may not even need any tests. Okay, let's talk about solutions and yes, there are solutions for hirsutism. In cases where there is an underlying cause leading to hirsutism, sometimes treating the underlying cause can actually help the excessive hair growth. There are of course some things that you might want to try yourself when dealing with hirsutism. Now, if you have PCOS and are overweight or obese, sometimes managing your weight can help improve hirsutism. And it's not just hirsutism you're improving, it can also help your general health. But even small changes can help balance your hormones and improve your symptoms. You can also consider removing unwanted hair by either shaving or waxing. Some people believe that frequent shaving stimulate hair growth 
growth, but this is actually not true. However, the stubble that follows hair regrowth can be quite obvious and can be quite uncomfortable. Frequent shaving can also irritate your skin, causing things like eczema or dermatitis. Now, waxing can be quite effective, but again, it can cause skin irritation and both waxing and shaving can cause this phenomenon called pseudofolliculitis. This is also known as razor or shaver bumps and is actually quite common in men who shave. It basically refers to inflammation in the hair follicles caused by trapped hairs when they start to grow out. And pseudofolliculitis can make the skin look quite inflamed and uncomfortable to a lot of patients. And actually, in darker skin types, pseudofolliculitis can result in post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which can make the area even more unsightly. Other things you may wish to try include depilatory creams or foams containing thioglycolates. What they do is that they chemically dissolve the hair shafts by disrupting the thalcyphite bonds in the hair. The good news is that they don't typically leave any stubble behind, unlike shaving, but they can be quite smelly and can cause skin irritation. They are also not terribly effective for treating coarse hairs either. Now, if you are desperate and are just wanting to try anything on the market for your hirsutism, I would actually recommend you trying on a non-sensitive skin like your arm or your leg before doing it on your face. Bleaching is another method you may wish to try containing things like hydrogen peroxide. They don't remove the hairs in bleaching, but what they do is that they make the color lighter so as to mask the appearance of hair growth. Again, these creams can irritate the skin and can temporarily lighten darker skin tones. Now, if you wish to know more about these products and how they work, I've listed them down in the description box below. Moving on from the things that you can do at home to the services we provide in dermatology. For difficult to treat hirsutism, in the UK in NHS, we have a licensed product called Venica Cream, which is licensed to treat facial hirsutism. It contains an active ingredient called eflornithine, which works by blocking the action of an enzyme, thereby slowing hair growth. And this is actually different from removing the hair. Trials done in this cream typically involve sites on the face, under the chin, and you can actually combine this method with other hair removal techniques for a more effective approach. What you do when applying this cream is that you apply on the affected areas twice a day, eight hours apart, so morning and night. Essentially, you put it on for at least four hours and you can consider washing it off after four hours. If you wish to apply cosmetic products over it, wait at least five minutes. You basically need to apply this cream every single day for at least eight weeks to four months before you check to see if there's an any effect. The downsides to this are skin irritation, dry skin, and also the fact that you need to use it daily as a maintenance on a long-term basis because if you stop using Vanica cream, chances are the hair will start to grow. In dermatology, we also sometimes consider other treatments to help balance out or reduce the amount of free circulating androgens. And they include things like the combined oral contraceptive pill, which essentially we use it for a longer period of time, for at least six months before we check to see if it works. There isn't any clear evidence behind which combined pill to pick as long as it contains two active hormones, estrogen and progestogen. They are also used as an off-label indication for hirsutism in the UK or except Dianet. But Dianet has an increased risk of blood clots and so you just have to, I guess, weigh the pros and cons with any medication. Then there are these anti-androgen tablets which essentially block the action of androgens and these medications include spironolactone and finasteride. Again, you have to be patient when using these medications because they take months to take effect. So we would give it around six months before we check to see if it works. And typically when these medications are stopped, hirsutism comes back. They can also be associated with some side effects like reduced sexual drive, irregular menstrual periods and breast tenderness. Most importantly, they are what we call teratogenic, which means that they can harm an unborn child during pregnancy and so we often advise women of childbearing age to be on a suitable contraception. They are not formally approved for use for hirsutism in the UK but can be obtained and used off-label with informed consent. We can consider adding them as an adjunct to oral contraceptive pill if hirsutism doesn't get better after six months at the start. Lastly, you might also wish to consider exploring procedure-based therapies like lasers, IPLs and even electrolysis 
cases. Unfortunately, these treatments are not widely available across the country in the NHS, so I believe you will need to source them privately. In electrolysis, you pass an electric current to the hair follicle through a needle. The idea behind electrolysis is that it will damage or destroy the hair from the roots permanently. It can be quite time consuming, painful and even expensive. And you need to make sure that the operator is safe and is registered with the Institute of Electrolysis. The operator should also be using disposable sterile probes for each treatment in order to reduce the risk of infections. Electrolysis works well for lightly pigmented hair like white or blonde hair because these hairs don't do well with lasers. Laser hair removal, also known as photoappellation, targets darkly pigmented hair because the target is the pigment called melanin. There are different types of lasers used depending on the skin type and they include things like Andy Yarg, Diodide and Alexandrite lasers. IPLs are not technically considered lasers but they can also be used to treat hirsutism. In darker skin types, we run the risk of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation with lasers and so this is something we need to counsel patients of and bear in mind. Again, make sure that the operator is properly trained and registered in the UK. Just a few last thoughts about hirsutism. All in all, hirsutism is actually quite common. The majority of people that we see with hirsutism don't have an underlying cause but it's essential for us to rule out any potential medical cause because they have an implications on the patient's general health. There are also many treatment options available both in NHS and also privately uh, in the UK and I hope that this video gives you an overview of the options that you can choose to treat your own hirsutism. If you wish to know more about hirsutism and the treatments available, I have provided some information in the description box below. Thank you for watching and see you again next time. Bye bye!